when I think about 16 at first coming onto my radar, it was that Zach Bell crash Mm -hmm. because that was like, I believe that was sort of close to this time period or maybe the first year. And, you know, like, I don't know if we're able to put it in here, but it's like the most catastrophic crash, like rider separates from bike. And then he was like back in the LCQ or something not long after. Um, I'm sure watching it, you're just freaking out. And then, you know, like the story unfolds and it's a good one, luckily, but. (laughs) That's a really interesting story. A big shout out goes to Jensen USA, Max's Tires for supporting the inside line. Welcome mountain bikers. Thanks for tuning in to Vital MTB's The Inside Line podcast. I'm Sean Spomer here with Jason Schroeder, tech editor over at Vital. And we are stoked to have Bob Weber, 60 Helmets, and Derek Rydell also joining the show today. I think it's going to be a fun one. We've had a pretty good morning. Went out to some trails in the Laguna Aliso area and had some fun riding bikes and learning about what you guys do. And yeah, stoked to talk helmet tech today. Been a, it's been a great morning, like playing hooky for a little bit and uh, getting out and getting a little exercise. Yep, it's yeah. perfect. Like you said, if this could be every day for work, that'd be, <laughs> that'd be yeah, pretty exactly. cool. Yeah, awesome. All right, so I'm going to start off with an icebreaker that I've been into lately in the last few episodes, but it's random. It has nothing to do with mountain bikes. But I, I think I know the answer for you just because you're tech-minded, you know, you're with you know, your skill sets, but when you fly on an airplane, you have the tray table in front of you, right? And there's the little, the toggle that kind of holds it up and down. Mm -hmm. If you get on the plane and that's crooked, do you fiddle with it and make it straight? I do not. (laughs) Really? Oh, I blew my answer. I thought you were going to say yes, for sure. It doesn't have to be straight for you. I have to have it perfectly perpendicular. Interesting. No, but you know what? I bet you the next flight I'm fixing it. (laughs) You're thinking back to this. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. What about you, Derek? Can't say I do. Oh, crazy. <laughs> right, you're the first ones uh, out of four or six people that you've said no. You're like, no, it doesn't bother you. But yeah, every time, I'm like, that has to be straight up and down or this plane's going to crash. I can't do it. So. Soda tab or beer can has to be straight, though. Really? Yeah. Oh. yeah. Okay, cool. Interesting. Similar vein. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and another one that I just learned on the car ride over here from the ride, you have one clipless and one flat pedal on your bike? What's that about? I do. Um, it's The Genesis was a tip over about four or five months ago. And unfortunately, I couldn't get my foot out of the pedal. I fell about 10 or 12 feet and did a massive push up. And I think I broke a rib and I was just like, dang. And then a week or two later, I fell again when I couldn't get out of my pedal. And I've been riding clips my whole life. Um, I was blaming it on the pedal, but I said, <laughs> I said, maybe I better try something different. And, uh, so I went to some flats and I kind of like them, but I really like controlling the bike with my feet also. And, um, so now I'm trying one and one <laughs> so far, the shoe on the flat is better and the clip on the pedal is better, but, uh, um, that's where I'm at today. <laughs> All right. Super interesting. Yeah. When you told me that, it's like, okay. Right. We'll talk about that. Like, let's get it over. Right. It's going to be, uh, you do more testing than I've been doing with pedals and, and shoe setup, you know? <laughs> I've ridden with this guy a lot and that was a shocker for me too when I saw that. That's awesome. Mm. All right. And another one that's kind of out of the order of what I was thinking we do, but Derek, you brought it up. What are the differences between a moto full face and like a downhill full face? That was Derek, when you asked that, we're kind of like, oh yeah, that's a great question. Let's talk about this. Yeah, that is a good question. Um, I think the moto helmets, uh, they have more volume for one, uh, which allows them to have more foam inside of the helmet to do work. And that foam is generally softer than what you see in a typical cycling helmet. And even most, um, downhill helmets in the marketplace, uh, today, in my opinion, uh, are too small volume, uh, too aggressively ventilated, um, which scavenges um, the ability to uh, put proper amount and density of EPS inside. So they're hard and they're not doing a lot of work until pretty high up in the scale. I look at Red Bull Rampage every year and go, man, you know, those guys should be in better helmets, you know, and they should be. Uh, so I think you're going to continue to see uh, helmets getting a little bit larger, 
uh, foam inside getting more and softer. Uh, and we're going to have to find other ways to creatively keep the athlete cool because obviously the athlete's the motor. Um, in a downhill scenario, maybe it's not as critical as a cross country or an enduro situation, but, uh, you know, definitely, um, heat's an issue. So, yeah, yeah. But the primary difference, more foam and, and softer foam. Okay. Good to know. Let's talk about 6D and a little bit of your history. I mean, we were out riding in Laguna and you were telling stories about how you used to have a moto track out there 30 years ago almost. And I know. probably shouldn't talk about that publicly. <laughs> I mean, some guy out there had a moto track. Yeah, I don't know. But my, yeah, let's get into some of your history. My very good friend, Pete Murray, uh, lives in Laguna. We've ridden moto together for 33 years by now. And we had a top secret little track out in, uh, we're in, uh, Laguna Canyon there that, uh, was pretty epic at the right time of the year. And we never could believe we didn't ever get busted there. Um, but anyways, that's enough on that topic. <laughs> <laughs> that's legendary. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. But talk about your history with, with moto and bikes and, you know, eventually coming into starting 60. Yeah. The, the, the. Reader's Digest version, um, my dad was military. I've lived in many places around the uh, country of the United States. And also I lived in Europe for three years when I was a kid, uh, 11, 12, 13 years old. Um, I moved from uh, Louisiana where we had motorcycles and lived out in the woods. And uh, my next door neighbor, top, top enduro guy in the uh, state, really is probably the most influential person in my lifetime from what I do as an activity today. Um, but anyways, um, over in Belgium for three years, I rode my bicycle every day. I couldn't ride motorcycles. Wow. And my brother and I would put our bikes on the train. We'd take the train to the nearest city of the GP and we'd go watch the motocross GP. Uh, met Jim Pomeroy and Brad Lackey and DeCoster and, you know, uh, all those guys at that time. And I, I came back to the United States in 1976. Um, talked my dad into buying me an RM 125, uh, went to the track, rode it for 20 minutes. It swallowed a reed and blew up. And my dad was pretty over it right away because, uh, <laughs> the repair bill was ugly. Um, but anyways, we got through that. I spent two years in Nebraska where I started racing motocross, um, progressed pretty quickly. Uh, then the family moved to New England and that's kind of what I call home before California. I spent 12 years in New England. Um, I worked for a Honda dealership, uh, through most of that time, I went from, uh, basically novice to expert in new England motocross in one season. And, um, and I raced as a new England pro for, for 10 years before I moved to California, actually 12 years, I think before I moved to, uh, California in 1990. Um, interesting thing. I was one of the top dealers in the country for Malcolm Smith mountain bikes way back in the day out of my, <laughs> uh, Honda dealership. And wow. Uh, what, what year was that? That would have been like 1989, 87, oh, right, 88, cool. right in there. <clears throat> uh, Malcolm Smith started selling mountain bikes and, uh, we were into it. I said, we can sell those and I want one anyways. And so <laughs> I found out years later in California, I was the number two selling dealer, uh, in the country for Malcolm Smith bicycles. Oh, wow. That's wow. Funny. Congrats. Yeah. <laughs> but anyways, I've always been into cycling. I, I really enjoy the freedom, um, that it gives me and, and, uh, you know, I ride as much as I can today still. Okay. And, uh, yeah. So what was the impetus of starting 6d i know you and i when we were riding up you were telling me about a crash you had that was pretty rough on your head but it wasn't why you started the company but you know where'd 6d come from yeah it's I, i've got an interesting interesting past uh and path to that um i've been in california since 1990 i moved out here to work for tom white at white brothers and uh spent some time in publishing for about eight years and uh and then moved back into the hard parts and uh, side of the business in uh 2000 i think 2000 maybe 2001 um 28 years ago, because I know that date because my daughter was about a week from being born. Hmm. Uh, I had a crash right here in Laguna Hills where we were riding this morning with some buddies and I was severely knocked out and concussed. I was out for over 10 minutes. Oh, it was wow. before cell phones. It was, um, 
we had enough time for one of the guys to ride back to a phone, call 911, and there was three ambulance or three cop cars and ambulance and a fire truck and about 100 people around when I finally woke up. And Crazy. my buddies were pretty worried about me and, you know, said, dude, your eyes were rolling back in your, you know, head. And, you know, the running joke was, hey, Bob, what's your name? And I'd always answer Steve. But uh, <laughs> um, that, that was a rough one. Uh, separated a shoulder, had a bad crash on my mountain bike. And, uh, I had a good helmet on at the time, as good as was available, and it didn't really do a whole lot of work. Um, so that's part of the equation. But um, I also, uh, in my professional career, uh, worked for a company that uh, we uh, were in the helmet space. And uh, we had an athlete that was injured with a rotational brain injury, uh, severely injured. And um, going through that whole process of... Um, learning about what happened and what the helmet did and didn't do. And it just always settled with me that there's got to be a better way to make a, a, a better helmet. And um, that's what got me really putting my mind to it. And uh, after after our relationship changed and I was uh, out on my own, I was like, okay, I think I'm going to try and figure that out and, and build a better helmet. And, and that's really what, that was the genesis of 60. <clears throat> did it start from day one with this, you know, like your ODS technology, kind of the, like the shell in shell idea. Yeah, it sort of did. <clears throat> um, thinking back on it, I, um, I, I called a very good friend of mine, um, Robert Reisinger, many of your cyclist, uh, viewers will know that name. He was the founder at mountain cycles, a uh, brilliant engineer. His bike was way ahead of its time. He had a aluminum monocoque frame bike with full suspension and disc brakes in 1990. And when I moved to California and I saw that bike, I'm like, okay, I got to have one of those. And was it a San Andreas? The San Andreas. Yeah, uh -huh. yep. In fact, it's still, it's still in my garage. I'm, oh. I'll never let that bike go. It's um, pretty special, nice. but <clears throat> I couldn't afford one, but you know, I, 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 I searched out Robert and turns out he was an old motocross guy. Well, so was I, and we, we weren't that old at the time, but, um, you know, and I somehow by hook or crook got myself on a San Andreas and, and I rode that thing for, I don't know, probably 10 or 12 years before I finally, you know, got into something better at a later stage. Um, or more current, I should say. Um, but anyways, uh, I, I called Robert. I said, hey, listen, I think I've got an idea um, on how we could make a better motorcycle helmet. And, I, you know, what are you doing? Because I need some help. I need some engineering assistance. And um, here's my idea. And he's just like, dude, what are you crazy? He's like, you know, why would you ever want to go fight the showies and arise and bells of the world with the mm -hmm. helmet? And and, you know, I hadn't really thought about that question too much, but I, I told him, well, I, you know, I think I got something here that would make a difference and I'm going to send you a bunch of stuff to read and, you know, just let me know what you think. And so that was a phone call one night and um, I sent him a bunch of stuff and probably a week went by or a couple of days at least. And he got back to me and said, OK, I understand the problem. I understand what you're trying to do and 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 how you're kind of, you know, what you're showing me here. But uh um, I think this is a worthwhile, you know, I think we could, we should try, you know? And so, uh, we got together on it. We started spending a lot of time on, okay, how do we build this thing? And, you know, we were, we were crushing EPS in my garage. I remember we made up these strain gauges and we had a bathroom scale and we're crushing EPS on the bathroom scale and how much we're recording, how much, you know, force it's taking to crush this EPS. And like, you're looking at the the pounds that it jumped yeah. up onto on the scale. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's, I got some pictures somewhere. I got to find them, but, uh, you know, we rigged it all up in the garage and just started educating ourselves on what the materials inside helmets were doing and, uh, you know, how we could manipulate them. And, um, we made up some prototype stuff where I carved out the inside of an old motocross helmet and then we made we had a second helmet we evacuated the inside liner and shaved down the outside of that one and then we put some dampers in there in between and and put it all back together and went and tested it and we had some really incredible data uh, that came out of that testing um and that told us we were on the right path and allowed us to go, okay, well, you know, now we got to figure out how to build this. We're going to have to raise some money and start a company and all of that. And, and, you know, that's the rest of the, the story there. But, um, 
it was it was difficult in the beginning. We we spent you know a year uh, studying and building prototypes, and you know uh, I took the I took my concept to David Tom, who I've got a ton of respect for. He's probably the most educated helmet guy in the United States on certainly on the motorcycle side, and and I remember the whole thing just fell apart on his desk when I showed it to him, and he's scratching oh, his head, and, you know, <laughs> looking at it, and and I'm trying to tell him what it's going to do, and he goes, you know what, you need to go talk to Terry Smith because he, I think he would like to see this, you know, hmm. and so he pointed me to the laboratory uh, here in LA, uh, Dynamic Research, and you know, walked over there with our with our little mock up and showed it to Terry, and the very first word he said to me, well, what are you? pulling around with motorcycles for, you know, he's like, you should have this in football and military. Hmm. And I'm like, okay, well, that's great. But, you know, I can get it made on the motorcycle side and motorcycle and bicycle people need this too, you know, so hmm. that's where we're going to start. And that developed a relationship with, with uh, Terry and his laboratory. We did a bunch of testing and, um, you know, it was, it was an interesting year. I, I mentioned Robert previously and, um, you know, I just, in, in the beginning, I really, you know, I'm not an engineer. I'm kind of a product guy. I always have been hands on and, you know, I tinker and I work on my own motorcycles and bicycles. I just like that. I like to be in the garage. Um, but I needed an engineer on this project and my history with Robert, we, we became friends a long time ago. I honestly, I had probably not talked to him in five or six years. You know, and I just called him and, and said, hey, man, you know, what are you doing? And blah, blah, blah. And, and we got to talking and I think I shared some of that. But, you know, he brought he brought an ability to solve problems to this. Um, he's got a background in manufacturing and uh, mechanical engineering. And, you know, when we were trying to go, OK, well, how are we going to support these dampers in EPS? You know, and because the if you don't if, if we don't give a platform to distribute that energy in the EPS, we're just poking a hole right below the damper, you know? So we had to, de to uh, divine, design these cones. And, you know, that was all Robert's good work of going, okay, you know, let's test these different diameters. They can't get too heavy. You know, that's also something in there that's not absorbing anything, you know? So um, he was really instrumental in just getting our problems solved early, you know? Um, he spent a month over at the factory at one point, you know, when, when we were getting started. And I think in the first year and a half or so, we, we did like seven trips to the factory, you know, and, um, we had to convince the factory that the helmet was manufacturable. Um, they had to validate our data. They, they had this critical engineering team because they, they do a lot more than just helmets in their safety division. Um, and we had to get past those guys and, you know, we were kind of going, okay, shit, are they, do they like what we're doing or are we just making their world more difficult, you know, because, <laughs> They get really good at doing the same thing over and over, over there, uh, and over and over and over and over, <laughs> but doing something different was a real challenge. And, um, so we got through all of that, but you know, I just, I remember sitting in those meetings and Robert's barking at the, you know, the engineers on their side and, and, uh, tell them you can't do that. Or why did you do this? And we have to change it or whatever. I remember he just about lost his mind one time we, we were over there. We had just paid for all this tooling and, and we go over and we're all excited because we're going to build the first EPSs, you know, and we go to the EPS factory and, and something's not right. And the guy's got a Dremel tool and he's grinding on our tool. And Robert's like, Oh, what are you, doing? You, you know, he just, you know, he's losing his mind on this guy, you know, and, and, uh, but rightfully so, because he protected what we were trying to do and, and gave us, you know, the, the focus of build of, of executing on the design that we needed. I couldn't have done that on my own. There's no way, you know, and I couldn't have trusted their engineers to understand what we were trying to do and, and, and accomplish what we accomplished together. So, you know, we just turned out being a good team and, you know, he's into moto and I'm into moto and, you know, it's just been, it's been really fun reconnecting and, you know, building this together and, 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 and going down the path we've gone down, you know, from, from having the thing fall apart on Terry's desk to, you know, getting it into, you know, I, I remember we had a, we had like 30 minutes to finish getting the first helmet assembled because we had to go in front of the chairman of the whole company and make a presentation. And there was a, a, a big, uh, 
gentleman over there that scared me. I mean, I just like, I, I, he just scared the heck out of me. I didn't know how to like talk to him. Physical size? Physical size, demeanor, and, and, uh, you know, never said too much. But when he did, he was barking something in Chinese and it just like, you know, and he turned into be the biggest teddy bear ever, you know, and, and, <laughs> and today we're, you know, we have a relationship, but um yeah what we went through on the on the startup part of this was pretty tough yeah where'd the design come from like it's it seems unique enough what inspired that um i think that's partly the old napkin story you know of just kind of going okay i know i need this helmet to rotate we, we need to separate the outside of the helmet so we wanted our our thinking was if we can uncouple the outside of the shell or the outside of the helmet from an inner helmet basically and then put some kind of uh suspension in between there to allow it to compress and displace and you know rotate and uh then we should be able to scrub off some of this rotational acceleration. And we were really trying to address the rotational side of the equation um, more so than the linear side of the equation. Um, but when we went to the laboratory and did some testing, we're like going, holy smokes, look at this great data we're getting on our linear side, let alone what we're doing on the rotational side. And if you go back and pull up our original patents, all that data is in there, you know. And so we we took that data to a patent attorney and sat down with him. We wrote all the patent language and, you know, got all that stuff filed. And, you know, you got about a year before that provisional gets uh, goes into the public domain where anybody can see it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a year or so later, but before we launched, I had a few people calling me going, hey, what are you doing? You know, I saw this patent and I'm going to go, well, don't say anything. You know, <laughs> yeah, we're trying to keep a lid on that. Um, I'll guarantee you there wasn't a day that went by in that second year that I didn't think somebody was going to beat us to the to the punch yeah. wow. you know, and, sh and show what you know that they were working on something the same and uh we got our helmet done and and uh we latched on to geico honda and and our first press event was at the factory the geico uh race shop and and um i remember before the before that presentation was done, our stuff was all over the web, going all over the world. Is like, hey, here's this new helmet technology, and um, that was an interesting day too. And it's giving me chills just thinking about it right now, to be honest. But that's awesome. Um, but anyways, yeah, that's kind of the Reader's Digest. I left a ton out in there, I'm sure, but <laughs> that's, right. that's that's how we got here for them. Okay, uh, cool. Got anything? I was gonna say the. Uh... When I think about 16 at first coming onto my radar, it was that Zach Bell crash because mm -hmm. that was like, I believe that was sort of close to this time yeah. period or yeah. maybe the first year. And, you know, like, I don't know if we're able to put it in here, but it's like the most catastrophic crash, like rider separates from bike. Yep. And then he was like back in the LCQ or something not long after. Yeah. Um, I'm sure watching it, you're just freaking out. And then, you know, like the story unfolds and it's a good one, luckily. But That's a really interesting story because it was February of 2013. Mm -hmm. So we started in January of 2011. Mm -hmm. Um made an agreement with Geico in probably August of that, of uh, 2012. Um, we put the helmet on Eli and he liked it and, and wanted to wear it at the Monster Energy Cup. And I said, well, we're not gonna be ready, but we'll have helmets by Supercross. So we ended up putting something together with them. We had our first trade show to sew our helmets to the market was that weekend of Zach's crash. We were at the Indianapolis Motor uh, Cycle Trade Show, set up our booth. We had a 20-foot booth, and we had our sample helmets in, and we're all there excited, and people are coming by, what's 6D, and we're telling them about our tech. And that night, they had an industry uh, party where they put Supercross up on the screen, and um, two of our investors are from Indianapolis. So instead of staying and hanging out with the industry we went to the, his house one of the our investors house and we're we're all excited to watch supercross we crack a beer open qualifiers go and i'm watching this and we see zach's crash and i'm just like oh my gosh we are out of business he crashed he looked like he was knocked out they cut the commercial is the most horrifying crash we've, you know you've yeah. ever seen and um we're just sitting there going 
shit, what now? Mm -hmm. And my phone, I got a text from one of the mechanics before they came back live and it said, hey, Zach's up under his own power. And I was just like, oh my gosh, thank goodness. Mm -hmm. It came back, he's stumbling around, but he's up and you know, they, he probably shouldn't have rode that night and I'm sure he had a concussion at some level. He assures everybody he wasn't knocked out. Um, I certainly hope he wasn't, um, but he was able to come back and compete. He won the last chance qualifier, made the main event, raced forward in the main event, had another big crash, um, passed his concussion protocol the next morning. And we actually had a dealer text one of my sales guys, 12 helmets Monday morning, please. When that happened. Wow. You wow. know? So anyways, yeah. Um, and, and, and next week we're going to have some fun with that. Actually, Derek's been working on something for our 10 year anniversary that, uh, is actually next week. And, oh, cool. and we're referencing that, uh, that, uh, <laughs> that event. Yeah. <laughs> well, it, it seems tough to, when you put helmets out into the world, that's kind of part of like, do they work sort of a thing, you know, mm -hmm. like, I mean, it's, that's the, that's the nature of the product, but that's just like so extreme on one end of it. <laughs> the, the Geico thing was interesting. Um, I called Ziggy, who's a friend of mine. I know I've known him. We used to race uh, together back in New England. And, and I said, Hey, you know, I've got this new helmet tech coming, you know, is there any opportunity to do something with you guys? He's the first person I called and he goes, well, honestly, Bob, we've been having a lot of trouble with concussions and we are looking for an answer. He's, uh, and he said, call Darren and talk to Darren. So I called Darren Borcherding and, and Darren was completely educated on helmets. He knew every tech that was out there. He was, you know, trying to figure out what the right answer was. Um, talked to Darren. He goes, this is, I love what I'm seeing here. We showed him our data. Um, they basically said, go to Eli's house and put it on Eli. And hmm. if Eli likes it, um, then we'll put it in front of the rest of the guys. So um, Robert and I flew to Eli's ranch on, in August of 2012, um, put him in the helmet. He went back and forth between his show in the 60 twice. Um, and then after that, he never took the 60 off the rest of the weekend. Um, we showed his mom and dad, we, John and Kathy, we showed them the data. We all had dinner. We stayed out at the ranch that night. It was really a cool experience. Um, but anyways, the next afternoon we were headed back to the airport and I got a text from Eli that said, hey man, Figure that out. I want to wear it at Monster Energy Cup. Wow. And then I was like, wow, that's just really cool. Yeah, and, that's awesome. Uh, so we put it in front of the rest of the guys when we got back and and it was all thumbs up. And and then we had to have hel helmets in time for Anaheim and that was a whole nother <laughs> challenge, but we managed it. And yeah. So, yeah. When did you decide to get into mountain bike helmets? Because it seemed like Moto's taken off. It's doing pretty good. So jump into pedal power. Yeah. So, um, like I said before, I've, I've, I've always been into cycling. Um, I've had a couple of good concussion cycling, like I shared one of them. Um, and I just knew the tech needed to get over to this side also. And so we started working on a bike helmet pretty quick after we got the first motorcycle helmet done. Um, we evolved to, we evolved to a, a BMX helmet pretty quick, which is was a derivative of the uh, motocross helmet. And then we wanted to get to the to trail category. And um, so we worked on that project. I think we got the helmet out in 2016. Yeah, 2016. Uh, 2016. And when we were developing the original 1T, um, we were ready to go to production and we got involved with this NFL head health challenge that we got invited to, which was a, a call to the market for, by the NFL for a energy management material. Okay. They didn't, they weren't per se looking for a helmet solution. They wanted a material that would manage energy. <laughs> and I think everybody knew they were looking for a helmet solution, but they were not going there. Mm -hmm. So we applied for this along with 120 other engineering and helmet companies to participate in this um, in this competition. And a uh, little side story here, but they they evaluated these 120 proposals. They basically said, OK, you 20 can submit a formal application and your product. And of you tw of you 20 accounts or you 20 companies, we're going to select um, five for um, a one year competition to see who wins this award. And the award was a half a million dollars. 
Um, we were selected into one of the 20, then we were selected into the one of the five and our tech was, it was pretty cool. We got, you know, an announcement. Okay. We're one of the finalists. You're going to be in this one year competition. Um, and here's pictures of the materials and they showed us little profile pictures, a little video of everybody's stuff doing some work. Well, they got down to number five. It was the university of Michigan and theirs was thicker, you know, it was 40 millimeters thick when we were supposed to be, when we were supposed to be uh, 25 millimeters thick. And I'm like going, okay, well, they must have something really good if they let them in this challenge with the 40 millimeter coupon when we all had to work with 25. Uh, NFL came back and said, okay, you have 50 millimeters to work with now. One year, boom, boom, boom. We went through the whole process. We won the whole thing. Us and Dynamic Research, our lab partner, Terry Smith, who I referenced earlier, we worked together on this project. Wow. But through that, we learned a lot about our technology. We did a lot of study of different materials, how we were connecting the dampers, how many we were using, uh, how we were holding on to everything. And we were, we had already gone to tooling on the 1T in our medium shell size, and we were getting such better results out of the um, new, newer design. I basically said, okay, we got to stop and change the design on the 1T so that we get to this newer, less restricted or more uncoupled uh, mm -hmm. design. And so we did that and got the one T to the market. And um, in 2016, we won the whole thing. It was all really good. Um, our helmet, our one T was, it had its challenges. I, today, I say it was a little too everything, too heavy, too hot, too big and too expensive. Um, but we did pretty well with it. We sold most of them, I think, on the motorsport side of the equation. People that were familiar with our brand, maybe 20% went to the cycling community. Um, but, um, you know, that's where we, we really need to do a better job with the two T of educating the cycling market that we've got a product for this customer and this activity that is really doing great work and different. But, uh, yeah, that's, that's how we got to the bike market in 2016. Interesting. Hey, does, you know, with winning this NFL sponsored thing, does that put you guys into like football helmet space? Yes, no, sort of. I'm so tired of talking about it. I don't want to talk about it anymore. <laughs> okay. um, I, I, the, the, the football side's been tough. <clears throat> we do have a contract with a company that bought Simpson <laughs> football helmets. And during the pandemic, we were developing our system into that helmet uh, for them. And um, they had, they're basically a startup also. Um, during the pandemic, the bottom fell out of their revenues. And right now that project's sitting on hold. I don't know if it'll ever get back going. Um, the football, Riddell's got such a grasp on, and, and, uh, on that market. And now for 10 years, everybody's been working on better stuff. You know, if you follow football at all, you might be familiar with Vices and, you know, they tried with a tech that was very similar to ours. In fact, honestly, I think influenced by ours. Um, raised a ton of money, like 93 million. And six wow. years later, they were sold to shut in receivers receivership for 2.6 million. So uh, big loss for all the investors. And, and uh, I don't have any desire to spend much time there. I just, we've got our hands full with cycling and motorcycling and, and that's what I'm passionate about. And that's where I'd like to see us uh, doing more helmets and, and a better job in, in the cycling space. Okay. Can and this morning's been just like a college education in, you know, forces on your head, the rotational forces, the impact speeds and all this, and gone through some pretty interesting graphs. Can you just break down the construction of the helmet and, you know, sort of those results that you showed us, you know, mm -hmm. speak to them how you want, but it's, it was really fascinating to look at some of that data. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, one of the things that we've done unique with our omnidirectional suspension technology, which is what we've coined ODS, um, where we've where we've protected our space and made our tech different, is we've suspended this inner liner. So um, not only is it free to rotate in any given direction under loading to scrub off rotational acceleration it's also suspended so that it can compress in a linear fashion fashion under 
uh, loading. And that ability for that liner to compress under suspension gave us these tremendous benefits on the low energy and mid-range performance of the helmet. So our system is allowing the helmet to work and be more compliant way sooner than a traditional helmet design that is manufactured out of a monolithic uh, piece of uh, EPS foam injected into the helmet or in molded into the helmet. Um, today, most manufacturers will try to work through that with multi-density foams so that there's a an area of the helmet that might be easier to compress um, because there's, le there's a lighter density EPS in that area of the helmet. Um, so, and we use multi-density foams also in, in our different helmets, particularly on the motorcycle side where we have uh, many different pieces of EPS making up the liner. On the bicycle side of the equation, the EPS is in molded into the shell during the molding process. And that's a uniform single uh, density injection. And then we use a low uh, density EPP liner on the inside, which is much softer. So we get this excellent um, compliance out of the EPP part of the equation that is also suspended and can rotate. Um, but when we when the helmet's called in for the higher energy demands and has to do work at the severe velocities, the outside EPS and the shell are really starting to engage. And that whole matrix of shell, uh, EPS, EPS density, vents, they play a big role in how the helmet might perform in the lab. Um, because obviously you're losing EPS in these areas. And then the combination of adding the EPP liner, all of that works together to make the helmet perform. So some of those graphs that we were sharing this morning, um, you can see the difference in where the helmet's doing work and how uh, in one particular design, you get a really steep acceleration on the linear side uh, versus a softer slope to that line and more time in the equation. Um, it's another nice benefit of our ODS technology is we're adding time to that impact event because we're allowing that EPS liner to, uh, or the inside liner, I should say, um, to travel under a progressive um, uh, loading situation uh, until it comes in contact with the other layer. And then if the energy is high enough, those two layers are together and the other layer starts to yield. So the goal is to use up as much of that space between your head and the outside of the shell of the helmet without bottoming it out. You know, if you bottom the helmet out, the accelerations just go through the moon. And obviously that's bad. Um, there's a particular brand that has an uncertified skate helmet out there for, you know, kids. And a lot of times somebody will ask me, well, what would you put your, you know, four-year-old in that's, you know, riding a Strider bike or something like that? I tell them what I tell them my recommendation would put them in that uncertified helmet because they're not of the age or mass or size they're, that they're going to override that helmet and bottom it out. <laughs> um, but it's softer and it's going to do what they need for tipping over on their strider at three, four years old. I would never put a seven, eight, nine year old kid in that helmet because you would risk the, you know, potentially bottoming it out. And that's why that particular brand has certified helmets also. But, um, I think for the consumer, education is really important because they rely on that certification label, you know, and not so much on the cycling side, but on the motorcycling side, there's a Snell approval, which is a voluntary standard. And in our opinion, the Snell is, uh, standard for motorcycle is overkill. And it's requiring the manufacturers to build a too stiff, too hard of a helmet. Um, so, so like overkill in a bad way, like yeah, it overkill, results in a yeah, product that's yeah, not that good. Exactly. Overkill in a bad way. It's, it's requiring the helmet to do, um, it's not allowing the helmet to do good work because you've made the helmet too stiff. So down there in that three, four, five meter per second range where you really want the thing working because it's been overbuilt, it's not working until up at that highest threshold. 
You know, I shouldn't say not working at all, but it's not working at the level it could be working. Okay. And I think if you go study the motorcycle side of the equation, there's a lot less companies today certifying to Snell than ever before, particularly in the United. Well, it's only required in the United States, but historically the dealers were always educated. Hey, Snell's the best. Snell's the best. Well, it's got this two hit requirement in the same location that's not really relevant for a motorcyclist or a cyclist. Mm -hmm. So anyways, it's uh, that world's changing a little bit, but um, coming back to education, you're putting your faith in the standard. Okay. So is it CPSC or EN 1078 or this new uh, EN 8776, whatever it is, the Swedish e-bike standard. Um, so the, the positives here is the standards are starting to evolve to include rotational components and to have lower, uh, some low threshold, uh, or I should say lower threshold impact testing, uh, still not as low as I think they should be, but at least they're going in the right direction by looking at the helmet a little further down the scale also. Do you want to explain maybe a little more the why lower threshold is important? And I think you were making the point that it's not like the speed necessarily you're riding at. Like we keep saying like lower threshold or like you know, like a, a lower rate of impact, but that, that groups together, most crashes you're going to have, like the mm -hmm. current standard you have to pass is at such a rate that like, you might even have bigger issues at that point. Like you, it's more important to talk about the, 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 you know, the kind of mid range. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a little bit, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's a little bit deceptive when you, Think about the testing. Okay, oh, that helmet's tested at seven and a half meters per second or 6.2 meters per second. Well, you know, I travel way faster than that on my bicycle. That doesn't seem very fast. Why is that, you know, why, how is that a severe crash? But in the laboratory environment, that helmet is going from seven and a half meters per second or 6.2 or whatever the testing uh, value is at that for that particular test to absolute zero in five, six, eight milliseconds. And uh, on rotational testing, it's maybe not absolute uh, uh, zero because it's glancing off and doing some rotational stuff off a 45 degree uh, anvil. But on flat uh, anvil testing where it is, it's coming to an absolute stop. Mm -hmm. It is a violent and severe impact. And at seven and a half, it's life threatening, uh, you know, to a human. Mm -hmm. So. To build a helmet to work at that level, certainly it's important, okay, but it's those, the crashes we have on our bicycle or on our motorcycle, they're well below that kind of a catastrophic accident. That's a, you hope that in that instance, you're trying to save somebody's life for sure. But we've got this whole other concussive issue where a small helmet with high density EPS that has very little standoff from your skull, it cannot do the work to relieve that energy transfer um, before it does damage. Mm -hmm. So the job is to make that helmet more compliant, right? So it's you, you can't you can't relate it to my travel speed or my horizontal velocity. Gravity's involved, the what you hit, how you hit. Mm -hmm. You tuck and roll, you scrub some speed off, you hit again, whatever. All of that comes into the equation. But like for that Snell testing I was talking about, you're not going to hit, roll around and hit in that exact same location at a high velocity again. Mm -hmm. You're going to hit, rotate, hit somewhere else. Some velocities come off, you scrub off the speed, and then the event's done. And certainly you need to be protected all the way through that. But the, the unfortunate part in the cycling market, helmets are are traditionally the standoff has been very small. Nobody wants to look like a mushroom head or a astronaut out there on their bicycle. And there's certainly a place where the helmet can get too big, mm -hmm. but this high density, low standoff is not good for the human's well being yeah. in a crash. Mm -hmm. Might look cool, but you know, <laughs> yeah. 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 I was pretty surprised because I'd never ridden in one. And today we rode the trail and that trail rocket that we rode was, plenty rough and if you're going to have a helmet flopping around it would have mm -hmm. been on that trail and stayed on perfectly i didn't notice it didn't seem insanely oversized or anything and it, it was super comfortable too 
Oh, cool. Thank you. We we had a lot of questions about that in the beginning. Was well, the helmet going to move around up there? You know, because you've effectively got this uncoupled layer. It doesn't move one iota. You know, it's stable enough that, um, you know, in the riding circumstance, it's doing what it needs to do. It stays positioned. It's flowing air. It's, you know, it's uh, it's it, you wouldn't notice it's any different than our, any other helmet. Hmm. Can you speak to the it's Virginia Tech that does mm-hmm. the study? Can you speak to what they're testing? And they seem to be like this kind of holy grail recently of helmet ratings, what they test versus what you test? Yeah. So um, the Virginia testing, uh, Virginia Tech testing is great for the consumer because the consumer can go to their website and go, okay, this is a four star or five star helmet. And of course, five star is where you want to be with your product. Um, you and they and they rank them all the way. The lowest score, I think, on the Virginia test is, you know, what pass they're testing the best. Um, our helmets in the five star rating, um, we're probably mid range in there, whatever. Um, the testing they do is the low, they have a low energy component. They're doing rotational testing and they're doing linear testing. Um, I don't think we're getting the full benefit of the low end testing that our helmet, where our helmet is so good. You're not seeing that result in the Virginia test testing. And you mean like lower speed impacts, the lower speed impacts. Okay. Exactly. Um, but you know, I think for the consumer, it's an excellent tool. They can go there and go, Hey, does this helmet manage rotational accelerations? Does it have a MIPS liner? Or does it have ODS or does it have uh, turbo 360, you know, or, you know, low density level? You know, there's many different technologies now that are trying to address the rotational acceleration. Um, so it's a, it's an excellent place to go check. Yeah, that's a good helmet. Okay. Um, in our particular situation, I think we're, we're doing so much better down in that three, four, five meters per second, um, testing. And I think the low energy on, uh, Virginia tech is 5.2 or 5.4 meters per second. So it's getting up the scale when 6.2 is the maximum. Um, but anyways, it's a, it's a, a valid and good, um, place where the consumer can get some data, uh, and not listen to the marketing speak of our company or, you know, Fox or Troy or, you know, Bell, Giro, whoever, you know, they can go, go, okay, well, that's what they said, but I want to check over here. Yeah. Okay. What are the misconceptions out there that you think consumers have? You know, it's like, oh, this is a hard foam helmet. It's going to crush and keep me safe. Like, Mm -hmm. what do you see the challenges of educating? Um, I think the first challenge is getting them to care and understand, you know, somebody that's been through a head injury is more likely to go, wait a minute, that was really not good. I had a couple of weeks of concussion concussion symptoms. Uh, I didn't feel well for some amount of time. I didn't like being knocked out. Um, I want to know more about helmets. That individual is doing some homework. And unfortunately, John Q. Average is not doing that homework. They're walking into their dealer and they're going, oh, okay, you know, what helmets do you have? What can you tell me? Oh, it's certified. Okay, that's good. I like this color. I like this design. You're telling me it's vented well and it's safe. I'm, I'm good. Here's my money, you know. Um, so I think, I think from that uh, perspective, it's, it just comes back to the individual of, how interested they are. Um, unfortunately, in the vast majority of cases, when they finally, re- when they realize they need to know, it's too late. They already had that crash, yeah. you know? And I've been there. I was one of those guys. I sold Snell approved helmets in the dealership for 10 years when I was in the motorcycle business as a dealer. Oh, you got to have Snell, you know? I didn't know. I never looked behind the curtain. I was rever- regurgitating what the sales rep yeah. told me, you know? <laughs> so um, anyways, I think it, 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 if I could tell anything, I would tell the consumer that they need to do their homework. They need to spend a little time studying and 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 learning. Yeah. All right. On the topic of homework, why a 60 versus a MIPS equipped helmet? Aren't they the same? They twist, they rotate, you know, that's MIPS seems like the kind of the big dog out there right yeah. now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I, I mentioned that earlier today, I get asked all the time, oh, so this is MIPS, you know, and it's like, no, this is maybe MIPS on steroids, but it's definitely <laughs> different. Um, MIPS has an excellent technology. 
They've been uh, in the market for about 10 years longer than us. Um, they had a really hard time getting traction um, before we came in, in onto the scene. Um, they had a contract with Pac in a snow helmet. They probably had some other stuff percolating, but I don't think it was at the market yet, in, to the market yet. Um, but MIPS has a design that is a shear plane that in most cases, some of their newer technologies, they've been able to move it to different parts of the helmet. But in most cases, and through the first probably eight, nine years of their uh, tech, it was on the inside surface of the uh, EPS liner up against the uh, rider's scalp. And, and, and what that shear plane does is allows the helmet to displace in rotation in whichever direction it needs to, to do this exact same thing we're talking about, scrub off this rotational acceleration. Um, the, the great thing for MIPS and for everybody else, and maybe not so great for 6D, was MIPS was really easy and inexpensive to apply to a helmet. You could basically add it to an existing design without too much engineering work. Uh, MIPS would help you do that. You paid a licensing fee and you were off and running. And all of a sudden, multiple brands, all, many, many brands, almost every brand, had a helmet running around with a little yellow round dot on it that said, I'm MIPS equipped. Um, MIPS has become the standard for rotational, the standard statement, much like Kleenex, mm -hmm. for rotational acceleration management, right? Our system is suspended. We've got that extra dimension of protection where the liner can just dis displace, can displace in three dimensions. And that's where we got our name. It's six degrees of freedom, which is exactly that. The ability of something to displace in whichever direction it needs to go. Um, so yeah, MIPS is, they, they've got a, they're a big step in the right direction. Um, I think for a long time, nobody took it really too serious. Oh, what do I need that in? It's just going to cost me more. You know, yeah, what's rotational acceleration? Nobody knew. 15 years ago, the NFL wasn't talking about head injuries the way they are today, you know, or they're the way they were 10 years ago. So their timing was right. They were ahead of us. Um, they had trouble getting going, but, um, you know, I, I think we were part of their acceleration path. You know, it's like, okay, wow, now this 60, that sounds pretty interesting. Uh, what they're talking about makes a bunch of sense. Oh, I can do this and plug it into my helmet without a whole lot of engineering costs or direct costs. I need to do that, you know? So I, I think that's the experience we've had. And, and maybe the key differences are just ours is suspended. We have three dimension three-dimensional displacement capability that they cannot match. Okay. And I was kind of surprised to learn that you talk with people at MIPS all the time and you're like, you're fairly close as far as like, you know, you're not just brute force angry at each other. No, the same thing, but. <laughs> no it's funny. Um, that it's not like we talk to them regularly, um, but we do have a relationships there. Okay. Um, and uh, one of the gentlemen that I used to tease, I used to tell them, hey, you guys should be paying us commissions, you know, <laughs> um, because I think we really were part of their uh, early path success. And, you know, they've continued to develop their tech and uh, they've moved it into spherical where it's between, you know, two layers of EPS. So they're getting more, they're able to round out that surface a little bit better and get some more work out of it. Um, you know, they've, they've got an excellent technology and, you know, they're a, they're a good competitor. They handle one part of the space and we handle a different part of the space. Yeah, for sure. No licensing? Um, no, not yet, except for the football project that we talked about. And um, this is probably something that I've learned. And it's been a hard lesson for me um, because you this tech has application in all different markets and you know we took on a big task of starting a helmet company you know robert's first question to me what the hell do you want to go fight bell and showy and awry for you know mm -hmm. i didn't put a lot of thought or credence into that part of the equation <laughs> you know i just go okay i know we can make this thing and i know it's going to be better but I didn't think about the marketing and sales and all that part of the equation when we were uh, getting started. And um, many of your 
readers will know one of my one of my board members and investors is Andy Ording, and he comes out of the bicycle industry. who's zip bicycle wheels, and uh, he bought that company and developed it into what it was, and uh, just a brilliant marketing, engineering, sales mind, and. You know, he's, he's pro- I've probably been his toughest subject, you know, I, he, I don't listen very good sometimes, you know, and we've got equestrian people calling us and skate people calling us and snow people and football. And, you know, I'm taking all these phone calls going, oh yeah, we could do it, you know, and I had to get kicked in the teeth a little bit of time, you know, or we weren't getting our own work done, you know, we weren't, we weren't uh, executed on everything we were supposed to be working on. And it just took a while for me to kind of go, you know what? We've got a brand. We're building motorcycle and bicycle helmets. That is a tall order. They are not easy to make. Every one of them costs more than you think when you're building it. Every one of them takes longer than you think, uh, to engineer it and design it and test it and homologate it. Um, we just went through this FIM testing on the on the road site uh, motorcycle road helmet side of the equation. It was unbelievably expensive to go through that and and to segue to the new 2206 European uh, motorcycle standard. Mm-hmm. And I finally I finally connected to me. You know, Andy would tell me, dude, you can never get the time back. Time is your most valuable component. You can't get it back. And I never. I never slowed down enough to really put that in my pocket and go, time, dummy, don't let it get away from you because I was getting distracted or we were getting distracted with other opportunities and stuff. Anymore today, I'm way better at saying, no, that's not for us right now. Um, I absolutely believe there is a place for licensing this tech into other categories of sport. But right now, my focus is building motorcycle and bicycle helmets. And um, the football project has taught me another lesson. You do you do some of that, and it's it, it's out of your hands the where it finishes up, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, it's uh, there's opportunity there. But for us today, we're focusing on building the next motorcycle and the next bicycle helmets. Yeah, cool. I like the focus. Is can you speak to some of the the challenges of what goes into making a bike helmet, let alone one that's uh, seems more complicated than just the average helmet. Well, our, our first factory had to buy new equipment for us, right? <laughs> <laughs> really? Yeah, the, there's been so many. I mean, that that is a long, long uh, uh, discussion and, and things we've been through. Hmm. Um, I think. I think some of the biggest things are when you when you design something, first you've got it in your mind and you're trying to get it into CAD. And there's different ways to do that. And I'm still not sold on the best way, okay? The first helmet we made, we built a clay model, okay? And on that clay model, we built it on top of an old motocross helmet. <laughs> and we started, we hired a guy, a professional from the automotive injury industry. Okay, take this 2D drawing and turn it into um, this helmet in 3D, in clay, right? Well, we all loved it. It was the first ATR1. I look at that thing today, it was huge. It was like, <laughs> it was, we, I'm like, what were we thinking? Why didn't we shave that thing down and go, okay, build it, you know, the right size. So then then we, we hand carry that thing over to the factory. They scan it into the computer. Now they're building this helmet. They've got a they've got a, a point matrix of this surface of this helmet, and it looks exactly like what we made in clay. We're like, yeah, cool. <laughs> it was huge, you know. So so all this time we're having to shrink this helmet and just you know like this, you know, as we as we went through the development cycle, that took a ton of time. So I'm going, okay, well. Maybe we use these other programs where we design the helmet in Rhino or Alias, one of these uh, rendering programs. And then you import that into SolidWorks and you got to, you know, put a point uh, uh, matrix on top of that surface. And now you've got your surface just like clay. Well, that's not easy either. You know, we've built a couple of helmets that way. Honestly, right now I'm looking at going back to clay because. Oh, really? Yeah, it's quicker you know you if you don't like that line you can uh, tweak on it and adjust it and then you go scan that and now you got your helmet and then you start at the inside and you build out and fill that space but 
what we've been through on the engineering side and the design side, you know, it's uh, some brands are all about the design and the features, you know, well, we're about the safety, but you're not the safest helmet's going to be perfectly round because the, the sides, the temp, your temple's the most fragile area of, of your, in an impact scenario, right? So you want to protect these sides. You're, you're better taking a hit head on than you are on the, on the sides. Um, so, but nobody's going to wear that big round helmet, right? So design comes into play, but you got to have the thickness and you get, you get the, the, the current helmet we're working on for Enduro. We're way down the path. And now we're, we're adjusting the design because it wasn't right. And that takes time and it costs money. And it's just like, you already told the market you're going to be out in 2023. You know, well, shit, we're probably not going to quite make 2023. It's going to be spring of 2024. You know, it's just these things that that's the hardest part of it. Helmets are not easy. And especially now as everybody's expecting us to do better and we hold ourselves to a very high standard. My position is we've got to be the best and we've got to keep our position at the top of the heap. And so that's what we work very hard to do. We do a lot of testing. Uh, we do a lot of examination. We're studying new materials all the time. Um, you know, things that could help us get and, and continue to keep a, a, an advantageous position in the marketing, in the market from a safety perspective. That's you kind of touched on it a little bit, but with, you know, the best helmet would be perfectly round, but if style and, you know, within reason, like size constraints weren't an issue, what would be the dream helmet or the perfect helmet? And with materials, are there materials that could help, but they're too expensive? You know, are there, if it was a kind of sky's the limit, doesn't matter what it looks like. You know, are you, know, you getting close? There's a company and I can't remember the name of it. They have an airbag helmet. Right. Mm -hmm. So, and it's a little collar you that you wear around your neck. And if you have an impact or you, it senses a fall, it, it pops and boom, you're, you're in an airbag, right? Yeah. I think I remember seeing that. Oh, yeah. yeah. I remember seeing that too. <laughs> it's not going to pass any standards testing, but it's kind of, kind of fun, right? You know, you don't have any restriction. It's nice and cool when you're out riding around, whatever, you know, uh, don't hit yourself on a street sign or whatever, but you know, if, <laughs> if, if the, if the right accidents happen, it might be perfect for you. Um, I think the ideal helmet for the cyclist, it has to be ventilated. It can't be overly heady, heavy um, because you're you're craned over on the bicycle. You've got a lot of weight on your arms. Your head's cantilevered out in front. If you've got a heavy helmet, it just wears out your neck. Your neck's tired, you know, and now the activity's not fun. So the ideal helmet is ventilated, lightweight, comfortable, of course, um, but it's got to be able to do the work. And that's the biggest thing I think the market doesn't completely understand it's got to do the work, you know, and the work isn't just the standards testing. The work is really down below that in those lower thresholds that we talked about. I don't think I'm not going to take credit for coining low threshold, but I don't think anybody talked about low threshold performance in helmets before we came along. Mm -hmm. And we probably coined that, you know, that, that, you know, statement. Um, but it's a fact. That's what you need to pay attention to. We need the helmets working where they most often need to be working. So, okay. yeah. Yeah. Interesting. What do you see the future of head protection looking like in, say, the next 10 years or so? Wow, that's a really good question. Um, like, do you think electronic technology is going to be part of it? Is it hmm. just enhanced materials? I, I look, that's a, that's a whole nother area, the electronic part of the equation. And we've had a lot of interest and discussion and exploration on that on the motorcycle side, because intercoms are such an important activity and part of that, uh, part of that uh, riding experience where mm -hmm. riders on different bikes or riders and passengers can talk to each other. Uh, heads up displays on speed and tachometer and next turn directions and all that stuff. Um, I, my personal feeling is that needs to stay with the aftermarket and that would be something that gets developed and adapted to your helmet of choice. 
um, on the cycling side of the equation, having some of those components on the bicycle helmet are potentially safety compromising. Okay, you've got a hard speaker on your ear. You don't have a lot of protection, maybe not even protected over the ear, you know, and you take a smack and, you know, that could do some real damage, you know. So um, the helmet from of 10 years from now, I think what's going to happen, we were, we're learning a lot about materials. You're seeing more and more people utilize U, uh, EPP, which is a multi-impact material. It's not damaged in that in, uh, first impact or multiple impacts even. But EPP has some real challenges also. It's heavier. Um, it's harder to work with on the molding uh, side of the equation. It's got shrinkage. So when, you know, when you're in molding parts into it, they don't hold on to that part well, where when you're in molding into EPS, you can put a snap basket in there and, and then, you know, it, it's, it's captured, you know, completely. So there's challenges with EPP. Um, we're using a lot of geometry in our design that helps us suspend that liner and get the performance we're uh, getting out of our helmets. And um, for that reason, we've worked really hard to protect that space. You know, we've currently, there's seven patents that we own uh, around the omnidirectional suspension, suspended liner space, and uh, there's others that are still pending. Um, so I think material advancements are going to be what um, you really see of the helmet uh, of 10 years from now, I think in the downhill mountain biking space, you're going to see them a lot more like motorcycle helmets. Um, those guys are putting more protection on their shoulders, their backs, their hips, you know, uh, their knees, their elbows, and their helmets got to get better too. You know, uh, we're finally getting some adoption on the downhill mountain bike side of the equation where, you know, for a long time, we just weren't even really considered. Um, we Which were, is, it's kind of crazy considering yeah what a downhill bike run is like it doesn't seem like weight needs to be i mean if a moto guy can handle yeah what they do shouldn't a downhiller yeah and then just the safety and the speed like yeah, exactly and that's where they're finally realizing it because the speeds have gotten so high and the risk is so high you look at some of those red bull uh downhill events you know i can't remember what they rampage what, not or rampage but the hard line, oh, hard line yeah dude mm -hmm. yeah they're dirt bike size jumps <laughs> And in some cases, bigger than that, you know, and, <laughs> and to do that on a bicycle, it's not, I, I'm not doing that. Okay. But there are people that are, and they need to really be thinking about the safety side of it because post injury, when you, you can't go back, you know, you, you only have one brain and if you mess it up, it's not healing well. So it really needs to be a consideration that I don't think a lot of athletes and particularly particularly young athletes pay attention to. They're young, they're invincible, they haven't experienced that injury that is changing, you know, a separated shoulder, a, you know, a torn up knee or, you know, a head injury that is like really slows them down and goes, hey, I need to think about this a little bit more, you know, for next time. So um, I think on the, you know, we're getting some adoption on that downhill uh, side now. We've been very well received in BMX. We've had some of the top BMX racers around the world coming to us saying, uh, you know, I'd like to be in your helmet and, you know, can we put something together? And, and uh, that's flattering because they're, they're realizing uh, that, you know, the helmet is better than the other competitive product that uh, they've had uh, access to. Uh, in the past mm -hmm. i would yeah. say it's top down too like when the top athletes have a incident like in world cup this year there's or past couple years there's been a lot of known concussion issues and then our phones start ringing you know mm -hmm. and bmx that happened mm -hmm. as well and the riders or athletes see the guys winning or missing races or, or whatever who've had severe injuries um and the, the awareness i think trickles down yeah, yeah. Yeah, Makes it's sense. it's a bummer that it takes someone mm -hmm. having an accident to get them to call your phone. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I can't tell you how many people call us and say, you know, I'm switching because I think Bob touched mm -hmm. on that earlier, but it's I, I had a severe injury or, yeah. or or I wish I would have started here. You know, we get that all the time. Yeah. yeah. Why do you think it's do you think it's the result of someone crashing and getting hurt like you know maybe not the person themselves but they saw x rider in a race crash and get knocked out and then they call you 
where do you think the like the disconnect is that they wouldn't just go straight to you guys first you know it's it's kind of like oh like i know they're pretty good like they're probably doing a better job as far as you know protecting me but i'm still gonna run x y or z helmet then they see yeah. you know a catastrophic event and then call you why <laughs> There's Why multiple the things, anyway? you know, brand, brand loyalty, um, uh, cost, you know, our, our helmets are generally a little bit more expensive than, uh, the, you know, competitive helmets. Uh, we worked really hard to keep this in check with the marketplace because the, the one T was, was way too expensive, uh, from mm -hmm. a manufacturing, uh, pace all the way through, you know, but, um, I, I think that, um, until they experience it and learn, you know, they're just kind of going, well, I've always ridden this brand. I like it. It's treated me good so far, you know, whatever. I'm happy with that. Um, I, 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 it's just awareness. And, 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 you know, I've started doing a little test when I'm out on the trails, you know, I'll be taking a break or, you know, sitting at the top of the hill, whatever. And, you know, somebody comes up and stops and you start having a chat and I'll go, Hey, what do you know about 60? And they're like, what's 60? You know, I, yeah. I, we are, we are way under recognized in the cycling side of the business. I don't think you could go anywhere. You know, the off-road motorcycle market knows us well. We've, we've done a good job penetrating that market. Um, the street market on the motorcycle side, we're getting there. It's getting better every day. But, um, you know, at the end of the day, a lot of those guys don't know 60 either, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but that comes down to, you know, I look back and I've, I've said it before. I, gosh, I probably should have tried to raise more money to start, you know. And we would have had more money for marketing or whatever. And, you know, that's a little bit of a cop out. I'm glad we started the way we did because it made us work hard. You know, we had to sell helmets and our helmets had to be, our helmets had to earn their place and they had to be good to sell. Otherwise we'd have been out of business a long time ago. I look at Vices and go, man, they had, they had two laboratories. They had, they, they probably spent more on their video to tell the world about their football helmet than we spent on marketing in two or three years, <laughs> you know, and, 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 and having all that cash available to do whatever you want allows you to do that, but it allows you to get irresponsible and make mistakes. And, you know, so while we haven't penetrated the cycling side, well, um, it'll come, you know, Part of this is, you know, this will help with awareness of who we are and what we are and why we're different. And then the customer can make their decision. I know, you know, our 1T, it wasn't perfect for everybody. On me, it looked pretty good. On somebody that thin and fit and a narrow face, it looked huge, you know, and you're just going, <laughs> God dang, you know. <laughs> you know, unfortunately, vanity is part of this whole thing. Style's part sure. of this whole thing, you know. I get it. So... You know, we've heard, we've worked hard to fix all of that, and and um, but we 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 remain focused on the system's got to be great, and our system is great, and you know, so it's just it's education. I think you know, it kind of keeps coming back to that. Yeah. What do the helmets retail for? For people who don't know, yeah, we're we're two twenty nine ninety five for the two T, okay. and uh, so you know, we're right there with the premium other offerings in in that space. Okay, yeah. Today's been an education for me no. personally. And, you know, I hope this podcast was a little bit of an education for everyone too. And let's, let's wrap it up with giving the average rider some things to look at if they're researching helmets and what a good helmet's going to do as far as, you know, look for, maybe look for these kind of numbers in a test result or, mm -hmm. you know, things like that. What, what can they look for to just, I don't know, make it easy on themselves to some degree? I think... Um, it's hard to see the numbers because nobody wants to put the numbers out there. And we do that on our website. We scrub out the competitors, you know, the competitive brands because, you know, I, I wouldn't want to be on the other side of that, you know, at some point in the future where, you know, somebody's outperforming us by a, a big margin or whatever. But at the end of the day, I think um, the customer just the, the consumer really needs to go, why am I wearing a helmet? OK, you're you're wearing it for the accident. You're not wearing it to hold your glasses. You're not wearing it to capture sweat because it certainly doesn't do that very well. Right. <laughs> you know, you're not wearing it for looks because, you know, your hair doesn't look good. You're not as comfortable, whatever. You're wearing this for the accident. And you want it to work 
during and when you have that accident. Mm. And um, so I just think that that's the biggest area. People need to step back and go, okay, I really need to be thinking about safety. I'm looking at what we do on our trail bikes now. I mean, I've converted. I'm onto an e-bike and it just makes everything a little faster. You know, you got a little bit more weight going downhill and you got, you can be a little more aggressive and, you know, it makes the uphills going better. And, you know, I ride with my buddies and we're all trying to run each other off the trail and all that <laughs> stuff and elbow the other guy out of the way or whatever. And you just get that way. And so you're taking risk and, and you want to, you want to make sure you survive the, the tip overs and the crashes and the endos and everything that comes with that space. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Awesome. Well, unless you have anything else, I think I'm pretty covered. The, just your comment at the end there. I've been saying the same thing. We go so much faster on bikes than we once did. Mm -hmm. And we still all find each other in you know, half shell trail helmets, Mm -hmm. probably when we shouldn't be. Mm -hmm. And I've been trying to transfer more to wearing a full base helmet on pedals and stuff and pedal rides, but you're limited. You're not limited, but you, I wouldn't reach for the helmet. I'm going to ride downhill in to mm -hmm. go for a pedal. Yeah. Do you guys see going into that space? Like call like your enduro helmets or your maybe not, maybe not a removable chin bar helmet, which mm -hmm. is out there, but something that you'd want to go pedal in. That's a full face. Yeah. I'm glad you asked because we, we haven't touched on that and we are working on that helmet. Um, it will uh, be in the marketplace next year, maybe the very end of this year, but that's probably optimistic, of, you know, versus where we are today. Um, but it's designed, it's in CAD, it's in tooling and it's happening right cool. now. And we've taken, we've taken a little bit of a different um, angle at that helmet. Um, I feel like there's some shortcomings in most of the product that's out there right now. And, you know, certainly we put our technology in it for the rotation and low energy, uh, part of the equation with ODS. Um, but we've also done some other things that are unique on that helmet. And I'm, I'm really excited to get it to the marketplace and, you know, um, Derek's been really, uh, close to all of our athletes and, you know, he's a little more connected to the bicycle space than I am. And, you know, we've got some riders that we work with pretty closely and, you know, while none of those guys have ridden in that helmet yet, we've talked to them about it and kind of where we're trying to go with this particular, uh, next helmet. And, and, um, you know, I think, yeah, I mean, I'll, there's, there's, I'll be, I'll probably have a chin bar on when I'm in doing some of the stuff I do on my trail helm, you know, on my trail bike in the future. And, uh, you know, but I'm also trying to maybe back that down a little bit these, <laughs> these days too. Um, I'm getting a little fragile in my, uh, upper and then the years I'm rolling into the right now, you know, but, uh, anyways, yeah. I think, yeah. uh, today's Enduro helmets kind of give guys maybe a little false sense of security mm -hmm. as well. Yep. Um, they're riding it. It feels like they're in a full face. It feels like they're in a downhill helmet, but really they're in a trail helmet with a chin bar, you know, so it's going to protect you. But, um, I think some guys think they're, the helmet's maybe more capable than it is. So mm -hmm. interesting. I think yeah. it feels that way, at least in my experience, you go from a true downhill helmet to a more enduro focused helmet and it's, there's a difference, you know? Mm -hmm. So it seems like a space that has a lot of potential. So it sounds exciting yeah. like what you guys got planned. Cool. Yeah, we're excited to show that helmet. Yeah. Nice. Awesome. Where do we find out about 6D helmets? Pretty easy, 60helmets.com, but yeah, mm -hmm. give us. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so obviously the website, our social media, uh, we've, we've yeah, the motorcycle and bicycle, we had them separate for a while, but we pretty much brought those together. Um, we do have partners around most of the globe. So, you know, there's 60 helmets in the UK and in France and, you know, Scandinavia and, you know, Australia and, you know, around South America, Mexico. So, you know, we, we're, we're getting the brand out and about and, and known. Um, but I think the website is probably the, you know, the most area where you can get in and study uh, what we're doing. And uh, we are hitting, a, we're, we're hitting a milestone pretty much as we speak next week, we're going to, uh, share some 10 year anniversary, uh, stuff where, uh, will be kind of fun. Derek's been working on some things there that I think are pretty neat and, and, um, we've actually been in business 12 years, but, uh, you know, we've been selling for 10 and we thought, okay, let's, let's, let's make a little, let's, let's share that a little bit, you know, yeah. as we roll into cool. this year. Cool. But what day is it? 
But next Thursday, next right? Next Thursday. Yeah, the okay. 16th. Yeah, yeah, maybe we launch this the same time. Why yeah. not, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, that would be very cool. <laughs> be perfect. <laughs> I like that. That's sweet. Derek, thank you. Bob, thank you. It's been fun. Yeah, guys, thank you. This has been really nice to, A, ride together, get to know you guys a little bit here this morning and have an opportunity to talk about our brand and our tech with you. Uh, Today has been really special, so very much appreciated. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. A big shout out goes to Jensen USA, Maxxis Tires, for supporting the inside line. Welcome, mountain bikers.